Hey everyone, welcome to the First City Podcast, a podcast where we go a little bit deeper into the things that we're learning and doing as a church. I'm Chris Emmelman, the lead pastor of First City, and I'm here with Renee White, uh, one of our deacons and our director of communication. And today we're continuing our conversation in the book of Revelation, and we're going to focus our conversation on numbers in Revelation. Uh, We figured it'd be good to give a little bit more explanation of uh, what's going on with the numbers in the book. Uh, How does Revelation, how does apocalyptic literature use numbers to communicate uh, the truths and the ideas? Uh, Are these numbers to be taken literally? Are they symbolic? Uh, And how do we understand that? And and, uh, just getting into some of the the challenges that you may face in interpreting uh, the numbers in the book. So uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to uh, not get overly nerdy because sometimes this stuff gets a little bit uh, weird and out there. So we're gonna try to make it as accessible as possible. So let me start with just giving a quick framework for how we should understand the use of numbers. If we start with the understanding that uh, Revelation is apocalyptic literature and that apocalyptic literature is symbolic in nature, so the images that, that are used are not, to be, are not meant to be taken literally, but are meant to be read symbolically, and this is just by the definition and the genre of apocalyptic literature. Uh, that helps us understand the, the way that we should read the number. So there's some rules already set in place uh, just by genre. Uh, that, that immediately tell us, hey, when you read these numbers, unless there is a good reason to read them literally, we should be reading them symbolically. So I think that's one of the most important principles here uh, in, in just how to read these numbers. It's not undermining the authority and the inspiration uh, of Scripture to, to read it this way. It's not somehow allegorizing things that shouldn't be allegorized. Uh, it is doing just sound reading of a text based on the genre. Uh, we said this, I think, maybe in the, the first episode, that, that every genre in scripture has its own kind of internal rules. So if you're reading narrative, if you're reading poetry, if you're reading uh, an epistle, uh, the different types of uh, texts have different types of rules to read. And, and so we have to approach apocalyptic literature with those rules in mind. And those rules lead us to a symbolic reading of the numbers. So we, got, we have to start with that framework. So any, any example that we use, our assumption is going to be symbolic unless there is a good reason to, to read uh, them literally. So th- just to be clear, this doesn't affect any book of the Bible. You can't just read numbers symbolically, yeah, exactly, specifically exactly. to this genre. Yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't get to just treat all numbers in the Bible as symbolic. Uh, it has to be within a particular framework uh, and, and in many ways, the the literal use of numbers are are how we can understand the symbolic use of numbers. And so, uh, in Scripture, there are literal. Um, so, so for example, literally twelve tribes, literally ten commandments, and those those numbers, while literal in those contexts, they also bring in a symbolic meaning that allows us to interpret the numbers in books like Revelation. So one of the numbers we see in Revelation that can be confusing is the number 144,000. We see that in Revelation 14. And does this mean it's referring to only 144,000 believers? If you're Jehovah Witness, yes. (laughs) That that was an interpretation that, I I don't know if Jehovah Witness still hold to that, but from my understanding is they had to back away from that once there were more than 144,000 Jehovah Witnesses in the world. Uh, so that that is a yeah that's a prominent number. It shows up um, several times in in Revelation, and this is a great example of how uh, not just sort of direct numbers are used, such as you know twelve or seven or four or ten, but multiples of these numbers are also used as a way to enhance the meaning of sort of the root number. So when we look at the number one hundred forty four thousand, uh, what we see. Uh, kind of mathematically, is 1, uh, 144 is the square root of, of 12. And so if you take 12 times 12, 144. Uh, so there's something there about this, the um, the doubling, not not times 2, but the times it, itself, uh, of, of this number 12, which represents the 12 tribes, and so the, the people of God. So when you, um, in the Old Testament, when you're talking about the 12 tribes, you're talking about the collective group of God's people. So if you take that number 12 that represents the collective group of God's people and you square it, 12 times 12, what do we get? We get a 
an intensification of the number. It's, it's an expansion of the number. And so it's meant to show uh, the growth of God's people, the uh, extensive nature of God's people. It's not just this collective, but it's a collective times a collective. And so uh, the, 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 the bigness of it. So just 144 uh, kind of intensifies the 12. But then you add 1,000 to it. And the number 1,000 shows up uh, later in Revelation, so Revelation 20, this 1,000-year reign. And the number 1,000 has this uh, symbolic meaning of a significant amount of time, significant number. If something exists for 1,000 years, if a king reigns for 1,000 years, it's just this idea of a, a forever rule, a, a great rule. Uh, so if you take 12 squared and then times it by 1,000, you're getting this increased intensification of the number of God's people, the fullness of God's people, the greatness of God's people. And so to read it literally is to actually undercut the, the symbolic significance of this. And so not to read, you know, 144,000 people, that doesn't seem like very many. But if you look at it symbolically, and it's like that's actually representing tremend a tremendous number of people. And you see this, how many people are around the throne in Revelation 4 and 5. How many people are around the throne in Revelation 15? It's countless numbers. And so the, the, if you, if you kind of look at the mathematical significance of 144,000, you see the symbolic sig significance of it is a, a fullness, a greatness, an expansiveness. Uh, and, and it's really cool just to consider how you take, take a number like 12 and you do some, some math with it and the, the symbolic meaning of it becomes, becomes quite great. So 12 refers to God's people. Um, yes. A thousand is, is magna, a magnification of a number or of um, whatever the number is referring to. Mm -hmm. So some of the other numbers we find um, throughout Revelation, one of the numbers we see everywhere is the number seven. Yeah. Um, so what's that number all about? So seven is one of the easier numbers to understand. Uh, this is a reference to you know the seven days of creation, which is, so seven becomes this number of fullness, this number of perfection. And so whenever we see the number seven being used symbolically, uh, the, the idea there is that whatever that is, is being done perfectly uh, or a full, fullness of. So in Revelation, you get, uh, there's three, three cycles of seven that are particularly prominent. So you get the seven seals, you get the seven trumpets and the seven bulls. And all of these um, signify judgment. And so the idea with these, each of these seven cycles is the fullness and the completeness of God's judgment. Uh, and so other places in, in Revelation where you're going to, if you see the number seven, uh, the, the intent is to signify whatever that thing is. Uh, there, there is a fullness, a completeness to it. Uh, seven heads on the dragon. Uh, what, is, what is that representing? You know, it's kind of the, the fullness and the completeness of evil rule. Uh, so there, there's multiple places where seven shows up and, and we're supposed to read that as whatever this thing is, it is the, the fullness and the completeness of that thing. So you've shown how like the number seven, you can see that in the Old Testament um, with seven days of creation, uh, the number 12 referring to the 12 tribes. How about the number 666? Is that, what does that mean? And, and, and do you see that anywhere in the Old Testament? Yeah, that is the, man, magical mystery right there is what does 666 represent? So this is, uh, this might be the most famous number in, in, in Revelation. Uh, a, a book full of um, intriguing numbers, 666, kind of stands out uh, for, for multiple reasons. Um, in our culture, uh, that, that number kind of looms large uh, as this symbol for evil. Um, you see this kind of show up on Halloween. You see you know, jokes made. You see movies based on it. So it's got a, a lot of cultural baggage and significance, in some ways in a good way, because it is supposed to signify something significantly evil. Uh, and, and so we, we don't um, look at 666 and um, immediately dismiss some of the uh, ways that it has been used to, I mean, maybe in um, hyperbolic ways or sensationalized ways, because there is something uh, profoundly evil about this number. So let, let's uh, try to get inside a little bit of this. So I think one of the things that we, we have to um, dismiss in, in some of the interpretation is, again, like this overly literal reading. And so if we see some sort of number pattern in our culture that somehow aligns with 666, so you know, six, uh, a series of six digits, three, three sixes, um, some, some way to kind of um, look, look at whether it be you know, social security number or something technology that, that kind of is connected numerically that way. 
Um, that's just a wrong reading. Um, one, that would have made no sense to our original audience. And, and two, again, it, it misses that this number, whatever it means, there, there needs to be some symbolic uh, reference. So the one of the more popular readings of this that has existed largely in uh, American evangelical culture is trying to associate it with some some sort of number, identification number, sort of, some sort of piece of technology. But if you read most commentaries, read most serious scholarship on Revelation and the meaning of 666, you won't, you won't have anybody really addressing that because that, that's not serious scholarship. That, that comes from something that's you know really outside of sound biblical exegesis. What you typically have within most commentaries is a debate between does this number, is there a way to sort of mathematically use this number to identify a person or, or an event versus just purely symbolic? And, and there are some good arguments to be made uh, re related to um, using this number to kind of identify a person. And, and so as the argument goes, if you use um, what is known as gematria, which is associating uh, a, a letter with a number. And then you, you know, different letters have different numerical value. And so if you you line up um, the, the certain numbers, you'll get certain letters and that'll give you like a name. And so this has been done. Um, and there's been multiple interpretations of who, who 666 represents. And one of the problems is, is you get people all over the map. You get all kinds of different names, all kinds of different rulers uh, throughout different periods of history. Uh, the best name, the best argument, the one that seems to be most sound, is the idea that 666 represents Nero. And why this makes the most sense is, one, the primary uh influence, world influence, world power, empire that the Christians, the original audience were dealing with was Rome. And, and so there's a lot of veiled references to Rome, a lot of symbolic um, images that, that represent Rome within Revelation. And so this is another one that the assumption is, hey, if Rome is, is primarily in view as the evil world power coming after Christians, then this 666 is probably connected to them. And so how you get to uh, Nero in 666 is... Uh, the, 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 the method is, is you take um, the name Nero in Greek and then you transliterate it into Hebrew. And so you take the same letters that sound the same and you move them over to Hebrew. Uh, that doesn't quite get you there. But then if you add the word Caesar, Nero, uh, and do the same thing, and then you, you kind of do the, the ascribing letters, um, number, numerical value, two letters, uh, you get 666. Um, now, of course, one of the, the other challenges is you have to misspell Caesar, and you have to add uh, a yod there that, that often isn't in the uh, traditional spelling. And, and so there, there's some problems with that. Um, and one of the other problems is, is there's no like strict guidelines for gematria. There's, there's no um, rule book that governs every, you know, th no matter what language you're dealing with, this letter represents this number. Uh, so it's a little bit you know, I should say it's very easy to manipulate. And, and I think this is why you get so many different names uh, throughout history. But there does seem to be at least some sound basis for arriving at, at Nero, that this, this number represents Nero. And, and even the, the language around, the, it says, you know, um, this calls for wisdom. It's, a man, it's the number of a man. Um, there is kind of a, 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 looks like there's kind of a call to calculate um, but that word is probably better understood as discern rather than you know do a mathematical equation. So there there are problems with trying to do some math in this way to come up with with a, a particular name. But even if let's say it, 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 this is Nero, let's say that 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 movement of gematria is uh, um, the, the, a good move. Um, there is still a sense in which there's a symbolic meaning to it. Because what then that, that is pointing to is, so is Nero as sort of the, the, the antichrist, the, the, the ruling authority over an evil empire. And, and, by, and by this time, Nero was dead. Um, but Nero sort of represented this um, evil ruler who oppressed God's people, who was the, the person in charge of the, the ruling a government authority and in charge of kind of the religious apparatus that deceived the world. And so he's the ruler over the bad empire and he sort of um, represents sort of the worst of the worst. So you can still find, even if you do the mathematical equations, you can still find um, 
symbolic meaning. But I, I think ultimately um, the, the best interpretation for this is, is not to do the math, but to, to kind of look at the number 666 and, and kind of what, what is that doing within the context of uh, Revelation 13. Uh, and so um, wh- what you see uh, in both Revelation 12 and 13 is you, you see kind of the formation of this unholy trinity. So you have the dragon, uh, you have the beast out of the sea, and you have the beast out of the land. So you get, you know, three. And if you look at what each of them do, there's a way in which they're imitating God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so there is a, um, you know, a, a, an anti-Christ element to it. There's a, there's a, a false imitation of, the, of, of God and, and who he is and what he does. Uh, and so you get the triple there. And then if you consider if seven is um, perfection, if seven is completeness, if seven is the number of God, then six is short of that. Um, it's less than, it's incomplete. And so you have this uh, pattern of three uh, following you know, this unholy trinity, and each, each one of them uh, are incomplete, imperfect, um, less than God. And then, you know, it is say it's a number of a man. Well, how do the, the how does the dragon, how do the beasts exercise their power? It is through man, uh, and so there there are ways in which the the expressions of these powers uh, are related to you know fallen, broken, sinful humanity. Uh, so so all of that sort of adds up to uh, a power and authority that that tries to imitate God but yet is less than God and is in opposition to God and uh, so that that's kind of where you get you know to the more the more symbolic uh, nature of the number that um, I think follows more of the pattern of how numbers are used uh, in in revelation but still I, I think there's there's um, there's some mystery here there, there is certainly mystery and Christian interpreters have, have wrestled through and uh, tried to offer up the best interpretation um, but but Again, the best interpretations are going to see the symbolic nature one way or another, uh, the numbers be used, and even if you want to try to associate it with a particular person, that person will have symbolic meaning. Um, and so I have no problem if someone's like, hey, that represents Nero. And I'm like, I, I, I see how you get there, and I think it upholds good sound um, exegesis, even if I you know, may have some issues with the math there. So there's, there's no power in these numbers themselves if... Um we see the number 666 somewhere, we don't need to be afraid of it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. If you happen to live, you know, if, if I lived at 666 Longview Street, it's not as if, you know, I'm opening the door to demons and <laughs> all of a sudden, you know, I'm of a portal to hell in my backyard or something. I mean, I think that was a movie. Um, or, you know, I, I remember, ah, what movie was that? Oh, The Burbs. You ever see The Burbs? I've heard of The Burbs. I, n- I never saw it. See, The Burbs <laughs> is like kind of a classic I don't know, was it late 80s, early 90s yeah, comedy? 80s, 90s. Tom Hanks. Uh-huh. Uh, and I think there's a part where they they go up to knock on the door and it, and the number's like 669 and then the the number like is loose and then it it drops and becomes 666. It's kind of ooh, you know, my neighbors are evil. Um so I don't think you have to, you know, worry about the neighbors that live in 666 whatever. That's know. good to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I don't even know if there are I mean, it'd be curious to see how many 666 such and such street it actually gets exist. avoided just like the 13th floor in some buildings. Yeah, yeah. That would be interesting. Um, okay, some other numbers that I see are fractions. Uh, yes. One fourth, one third. Yeah. Um, do these have also symbolic interpretations? And, and do they have, um, it, you see a kind of increase in one fourth and then it's one third. Is the order of those um, important in any way? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, so if you look at, um, so one one fourth one third is is it's not a, a full number, uh, and so what it, what is how is three used? How is four used? I mean, in particular, we see a number four used in in different places in Scripture to to talk about uh, a completeness. And so you have the four corners of the of, of the world. Uh, you have four beasts coming out of the sea in Daniel uh, that can represent the uh, scope of history. Um, and so four has some symbolic reference to, again, kind of fullness, completeness of, of something. And so one fourth is going to be incomplete. And particularly in those contexts, it's referring to uh, restraint. And so God's judge, active judgment in the world, but not the full and complete judgment hasn't come yet. So 
Uh, it, it, it's meant to say four kind of represents, you know, the four corners of the earth, everything. One fourth means, hey, not everything has been destroyed. Not everything has been judged. So it's, it's not over yet. And similar with one third, you know, so three, um, there are, you know, the Trinity there, you know, that, that there's ideas of completeness that kind of come with three. And so one third, uh, is incomplete. It's not full. It's not done. It's not complete. Um, now why does, does one third and one fourth, like the shift there have something, is there, is there kind of an indication there? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I don't think so, other than it's just a shift in the imagery. Um, I don't know, you know, why why is it used one third in one cycle and one fourth in another? And does that does that shift in and of itself uh have any significance? Maybe, maybe. I haven't gone down the rabbit hole that far to see if, if that has any significance. But but I think the fractions themselves signal um an, an incompleteness. It it isn't done yet. Um, when it comes specifically when it comes to these judgments. So the way you're explaining this is making sense, but say you're an average person who hasn't read commentaries on scripture. Is there um, an expectation that if you read scripture enough, you're going to come to these conclusions or how do, how does one um, figure this out on their own? Yeah, that's again, good, good question. I mean, there is, there is a sense in which some knowledge of scripture is required because um, the majority of the imagery that is in Revelation comes from the Old Testament and, and requires somewhat of a familiarity with the Old Testament. Uh, these aren't random images. These aren't random numbers. Uh, so if you don't have a, a basic framework for some of this, it, it will be confusing, and it won't be immediately obvious what some of this stuff means. And even if you have a, a, a level of understanding, it, it may not be immediately obvious um, because Revelation never goes, you know, as Jeremiah said, or as Daniel said, I mean, it just uses the illusions. It doesn't like reference them. And so sometimes it's hard to catch where they're coming from. Uh, but this is an important piece of, uh, of recognizing that scripture interprets scripture. Uh, these things are connected and revelation is the final book of, of the canon. And so there is a sense in which, yeah, it's going to draw on everything that has come before. So, you know, it, it, it you sometimes hear, you know, to read the Bible and understand the Bible, you don't really have to have any, um, you know, knowledge or you have to have any education. And and there's some sense in which that stuff is true. Uh, there there are plenty of places in Scripture where the meaning of the text is is pretty straightforward and clear. Uh, but but I think we have to be careful not to oversell that because Scripture does interpret Scripture because Scripture is this organic unfolding of God's plan and that it's interconnected that. I mean, you look at the way Jesus taught the scriptures. He taught the scriptures as if, hey, if you're going to understand what I'm teaching, you have to have an understanding of the Old Testament um, on the road to Emmaus. He opens up the Old Testament and shows how these things pointed to him. And so if they were going to understand his mission and who he was, they had to have some understanding of the Old Testament. If we're going to understand God's judgment and his plan of salvation, we're going to have to have an understanding of how this plan has unfolded through the ages. So I don't want to... Um, I don't want to discourage anybody and to say, well, if I haven't, if I don't understand the Old Testament, then I'm I can't ever read Revelation. But I will say, you you do have to do some work. Like you do have to be faithful to try to understand where these images are coming from and how they fit together and how they point uh, to the plan of God. So, um, yeah, you 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 do have to you do have to have a framework. Is it kind of like watching some of the newest Star Wars movies or Marvel movies and not yeah, have watched you the earlier ones? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think that's good. Like some some books in the Bible are more standalone. Um, they might have some references to to, to other things that um, you, you you know to understand them will, will help your understanding. But but some books require much more of understanding the bigger story, and Revelation is certainly one of those. So yeah, great analogy. Well, we hope this episode has been helpful in your understanding of the numbers in the book of Revelation. If you have questions about other parts of the book, maybe there are other details that you'd like more explanation on, feel free to shoot us an email at renee at firstcitybellevue.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time for another episode of the First City Podcast. Mm-hmm.